purpose, purpose and goal is to relate together, build strong relationships. Kenny talked about that a, a little bit. Thank you for hosting us, Kenny and MC. And, um, he talked a little bit about that, and so I, I just want to reemphasize uh, what he said. Our number one goal for these three days is to build strong relationships. Now, we're going to grow together, and we're gonna, we'll have some sessions when, uh, when we'll look at some different principles as leaders that we can grow. But a lot of times, uh, lead pastors, and most of you are, are leaders, are high-level leaders, whether you are the lead pastor um, or leading a church or you're one of the executive pastors. A lot of times, it's, it's, it's hard just to get into an environment where, where you don't have to uh, produce something. You can just hang out. You can enjoy, and, uh, and you can build relationships. That's what we want this to be. So that's our goal, number one goal, number one takeaway, isn't for somebody to speak and for us to learn, even though we'll do that. Our number one goal is to uh, get to know each other better, um, take away from this maybe some names of people that we'll chat together with, send some texts, encourage each other, and uh, who knows, maybe build some, some great friendships. I know a lot of us are friends here, but... Uh, God might have something else in mind. He might want you to meet somebody here uh, that maybe has walked the path that you're walking on and could, could just walk alongside you. So that's what we want to happen. In the meantime, we'll have fun. So we've built into our schedule relational time. And our goal is to just build the environment. That's what we're doing as, as the lead team, as, as uh, the board, Pastor Dwayne, myself, Clint, I see Clint's back there. There's Clint and uh, James Sonic. James is not here. He had back surgery uh, about uh, four weeks ago, I believe. I spoke uh, at his church this weekend. I, uh, Clint was there last weekend, and uh, he's doing well. But he can't uh, be standing or sitting for more than a half hour, so we couldn't ride up here. So, uh, but he's doing fantastic. But our, as a lead team, our number one goal is to create environments where we can be equipped and where we can relate together. So that's what this is about. Thank you for taking your time, your resources, and uh, getting everything ready, and uh, for coming on up and, and for being together. So it's our privilege and honor to serve you, and that's what we intend to do, beginning with some good food. How was that? That was... That was, I think I, I mentioned it to a couple people here. I went around to a couple tables, and, and I don't know where I came up with it, but th that was like a knee-jerk reaction to last year. What I mean by that, if you were here last year, usually we're in one place, and when you're in one place, you have to use the catering service of that place. And uh, last year, we, we used uh, some new hotels and this and that, and it just didn't work out real well. We had, if you weren't first in line, we had a lot of people go away from uh, our meals hungry. And uh, so, and I'm kind of knee-jerk anyways. It's like, all right, that will never happen again. So, uh, so we were on the lookout for a place that would allow us to bring our own team. And uh, sooner or later, we'll honor Barry, but uh, we, we've got Barry here with us and, uh, and some of his team. So they're going to do a spectacular job of, uh, of providing uh, the meals and everything we're eating. So that, that was what that was about, and uh, you will not go hungry. Nothing else might work out. It might rain. <laughs> it may be 30 below in Traverse City in June. No, we've ordered some, some good weather for tomorrow. Uh, we, we sent in that, that solicitude, how do you say that? That request. Those that know me know that I have to have a little translation now and then. But uh, we turned in that request, and, and so we'll have that. So we're here to serve you. If you need anything, talk to me. Talk to Clint. Talk to Pastor Dwayne. Or, um, or like everybody said, talk to Shelly because uh, we're, we're here to take care of you. But if you, if you need anything on a, on, a, on a spiritual level, anything we could do to, to just help you along, um, if you're in a bump in the road, we're here. Matter of fact, tomorrow we're going to take some time. Dan will, uh, Pastor Dwayne in the morning. We've got a split session tomorrow. And, uh, and then Dan Seaborn will be here with us. And, and tomorrow night we'll take some time. We're just going to take some time, worship, and pray for people. And uh, we're here to relate together and, and, and to help you be all that God has, has destined you to be. That's our goal. 
and that's what Link is all about. So thank you for being here. I'm going to take a few minutes tonight and share something really simple, just super simple. Um, everybody here will have to take this and contextualize it because uh, it, it's just one of those things, depending on where, where you live, the size of your church, um, your city, etc., etc., etc. It'll take a little bit of, uh, of contextualizing. But I developed this for a conference that, that we hosted in, in Latin America. We had, we had uh, I don't know, I can't remember how, how many people there. We had probably 87 churches represented, seven countries, eight countries. And uh, I developed this. I spoke, I, I've done it, done it one time in, in English. I translated it to Spanish, and, and so we're going to do it. I've called it Love at First Sight, and this isn't about dating or marriage or anything like this. This has to do with the church and the church being an awesome, incredible, excellent environment. So uh, kind of the subtitle would be Only God Sees the Heart. What I mean by that is the people that we're trying to reach, they see the outside. They feel the environment. They, they, they feel emotions, etc. And I just want to just share this with you and... and uh, I think, I think we'll have some real practical things to take away from here. So um, I have a quick video, and I'm going to throw it up on the screen. It's about 37 seconds, so don't miss it. Cool. So here's the test. What do all of those places have in common? What's that? <laughs> what do all those places have in common? <laughs> What's that? They all need the gospel. That's true. That's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> destination, their destinations. Their attraction, those places haven't come because those are the most, the most visited places in the world. And what those places have in common is that hundreds and millions of people visit those places every year because of a certain charm. Some of them because of their physical appearance. Some of them because of the experience, for example, Disney because of the experience they help a person to create. You know that and I know that. We all know that. We get that. Some of, some of us have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to go to some of those places to experience, say with me the word experience, experience the charm of certain places. And you and I know that and, and, and hundreds of millions of people visit those places every year. And it's, it's the, the, the appearance and the experience that draws those people. It's the same concept that draws people to parks, to malls, to restaurants. It's the charm. It's the experience. It's what people feel when they walk away from those places. And you and I both know that. You and I know that if we're in a place that we just liked it, we're going to go back. You and I know if we're in a place that there's just a, a certain appeal, a certain charm, we're going to go back. So here's the challenge. Why would we think, you and I as church leaders, why would we think that when it comes to church, people would judge us with some other criteria? The reason that, that, that I was passionate about sharing this with, with a bunch of Latin American leaders, hundreds of, of, of pastors of churches, is so many times as church leaders, we, 
I think we know it, but we think that people will judge us by our heart. We'll th- you know, we think, well, he's got a good heart. And they'll judge us by our heart. But there's a little Bible principle that I'm going to share with you today that will help you and I just remember. I'm, I'm probably not going to tell you anything you don't know. You and I need to remember that we judge people or we judge places by the feel, by what we experience. We decide whether we'll go back. We've all been to a restaurant where we're about halfway through our meal and we've pretty much decided whether we're going to go back or not. And it has to do with the whole experience. It doesn't just have to do with the chicken we're eating. Or the steak. It has to do with the experience from from our walking in, how long it took us to be seated, what the place feels like. Is it light? Is it dark? Is it smoky? Of course, I don't think in the States there's not much smokiness anymore. Um, Is it smoky? Is it it some? Is it, how did I feel? And we pretty much decide whether we're going to go back. And in the church world, sometimes I think we forget about that. And as lead pastors, and I'm really going to focus on lead pastors today, as lead pastors, we spend hours and hours and hours of our week preparing for our message, which we should. I dedicate between 10 and 15 hours to developing a message, and usually I develop them about eight weeks out. So we need to do that. But a lot of times we spend so much time preparing our message, we forget that our message is just one thing inside of a whole experience that somebody has when they come to our church. And and, and we cannot kid ourselves. We have to pay attention to the experience. I talk to a lot of pastors that kind of just shaking or scratching their head. They're like, "We, we have, and matter of fact, I'm one of them. We average 39 visitors, so in other words, just under 40 visitors a week. So I'm like, let's see, Bob, uh, we should have a church of about 12 million. (laughs) It's like, where are all these people? What's going on? You know, and I, I go to churches and, and pastors will say, pastors will tell me, we had 15 get saved, we had 20 people get saved, we, ha- we have an average of 150 people get saved every week. Uh-huh, and where are they? And I understand follow-up, and, 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 and this is just one point in a million points that we could, that we could talk about, but I want to focus on this point. I want to talk about our church experience. I want to talk about excellence. I want to talk about how we prepare our whole church experience For when a person walks in, do they walk away like they walk away from Disney, like, I got to bring the grandkids back here. You know, someday, I got to come back. I got to, do they walk away next week? What time do I need to be here? Because when it's all said and done, we know that if a person, if we can get a person to be in an environment where God's spirit is, where the word's being preached, and, 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 and where some, if we know that sooner or later, they could be the hardest hearted person in the world, sooner or later, something's gonna happen. Transformation's gonna happen on the inside. And when it's all said and done, they're gonna receive Christ. But we gotta get them back. We gotta get them back. So, what are they experiencing? So, that's all I wanna talk to you about today. That's just basically it. And, and, and I, I wrote something down. I won't, I won't. I won't read it literally because I've got some language in there. It's a little iffy. But um, it's like, how much junk do, do people have to go through on a Sunday experience to hear the gospel? And you can translate the junk to anything you want. How much, how much junk? And, and, and I do that. I think it was about three, four weeks ago. That I heard Doug Bergsman's back. That Do you want to? Do you want to translate that word? <laughs> oh, shame on you guys. I think Carla and I, um, about a month ago, we were, I was in town and I wasn't preaching, which, which is kind of out of the ordinary. And we decided we're, we're just going to do a regular service. We're, we're going to do a regular service. We're just going to go to our church and experience what people experience. I walked away from there. I'm like, oh, we got to get better. We got to get better. You got to be kidding me. This is what somebody experienced. And, and we're pretty good. We're not, you know, we're not horrible. But 
but when you see and when you feel the experience through other people, see, because we show up early. You know, we don't expect anybody to greet us because you're the pastor, you show up, you know, you're, in the, you're, you're, you're doing whatever you do on Sunday morning, and so you don't experience your church. And so I experienced our church, and I was like, we have, we have got to get better. That guy has got to smile. You know, that guy's got to wave his flag better. You know, it's like, where's the sign? You know, and, and that's what I'm talking about. You know, and a lot of times I think we spend a lot of time, which we should, preparing as lead pastors. You know, our message should be on point. We should be awesome. Multimedia should be set. I mean, everything, everything should be good. But, but how are we going to impact people's lives if we can't get through their first filter, which is what they experience? So that, that's what I want to talk about. And there's a little Bible principle and you've, I'm sure you've, you've preached on this probably, but I'm just going to drive it home. And, uh, and the Bible principle is, is, is in the Old Testament, and it, and it has to do with the story of, of Saul when God basically said, all right, he's done, I'm going to anoint a new king, and he wanted Samuel, the prophet, to do it. And if you remember the story, Saul was this, with a, with this great, big, handsome, incredibly looking man the, the Bible says he was impressive. When you just looked at him, it was like, wow. And God decided that, that, that a new king needed to be installed. Uh, Saul was out, and, and this young boy was going to be anointed as king. And, and, and the Bible said he, he wasn't impressive. He, he was okay. He was, he was okay. And, uh, but Saul, excuse me, God wanted Samuel to go and to anoint this new king. But the old king was awesome. The old king, you'd look at him and it was like, whoa, that's the king. The new king wasn't that impressive. So God had to talk to Samuel. Now remember, Samuel, during this time in history, was most likely the most spiritual person on planet earth. He was God's man. God wanted to say something. It was through Samuel. But yet God has to talk to Samuel, and God has a conversation with Samuel, and God has to give him a specific point about anointing this new king. And so you all have read this story, and so I'm just going to read it. So the, the prophet Samuel is, is, you know, he's, he's getting instruction from God, and God doesn't just tell him, hey, go anoint this other dude. This is what God tells him. It's in 1 Samuel 16, 7. I'll put it up here on the screen. It said, but the Lord said to Samuel, once again, Samuel, the most spiritual man on planet Earth during those times, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outside appearance. Say with me, outside appearance. Okay, this is God telling Samuel, the most spiritual man on planet Earth, he's going to tell him, okay, Saul's out, this new dude is in, but he's different on the, on the outside. So God's got to give him a lesson, and the lesson is this. Man sees the outside appearance. Only I see the heart. That's what he finishes up saying. He said, man sees the outside appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Who looks at the heart? The Lord. So God talks to, to Samuel, the most spiritual man on planet Earth during that time, and God's got to tell him, look, Samuel, your tendency, because you're human, your tendency is going to be to look at the outside appearance. Only I see the heart. I've seen David's heart. I'm going to tell you who to anoint. You anoint him. Don't look at the outside appearance because that's what man looks at. So in this, in this whole story, I mean, it's a cool story, and I'm sure you've preached on it, but in this story, there's a little principle, and the principle is this. Man sees the outside appearance. Man judges by the outside appearance. You and I judge things by how we feel, what we see, what we smell, how it is. 
God sees the heart. So why would we think it's, it's, it's any different? Man sees, and I'll put that up there, man sees the outside. Only God sees the inside. And what God declared to Samuel is, is a basic truth. And accept it or not, that's the way people are judging our churches. Accept it or not, that's the way people are judging our God. People don't come to church and think, wow, that, that, that worship leader has an awesome heart. Can't sing Jack Diddley, but he's, what a cool heart. They don't think that way. You may know the worship leader, and, and, and they may have a wonderful heart, but people don't judge it by, by, by that. People don't judge our message by our heart. They judge our message by our message. People don't judge the sound guy by his heart. Billy, Billy's a good man back there. Billy, Billy is our sound guy during this week, and people are not going to judge Billy by his heart. People are going to judge him by the sound. Why? Because that's the way people judge things. I'm just going to keep driving this home because I know we know it, but a lot of times we kid ourselves. We think as long as I preach good, and, if, and, and, and if, if people raise their hands and they'll get saved, and I know we want them to get saved, but, but what does that mean? We want them to come back into an environment to where they begin to walk out that relationship. If they don't like the environment, they're not coming back. They're proving it. It doesn't matter how good certain pieces are. We have to create something that people Love And when I shared this with, with, with a, a bunch of pastors from Latin America, and you all know my passion is Latin America. Carl and I have lived in Mexico for, for 32 years. There's this huge gulf between relevant environments and the church. And so many times we just, you know, the church, and I'll just talk about Latin American leaders in, in church. We just, we, we, we think, okay, well, if, if, if God is there, if we can... If we can just get people in an environment, and I believe some of this, we can get people in an environment where, where God's present, presence is, they will be touched. They will be, I agree. I agree. But I don't want to do it just one time. I want them to come back again and again and again. And this little Bible truth helps me to understand I've got to be good. As a leader, as a lead pastor, it's not just about preaching. It's about growing a team. It's about building a team. It's about building an environment. And before this thing is done, I'm going to read you Matthew 5, where Jesus talks about being a light in a light set on a hill. You know, so I'll just, I'll just go get out there and, and tell you that's what we're going to talk about. Is your church a light? Is, is, is your church and your community the go-to place? Is it like there's a wow factor? It's just cool. And I'm not talking about money because we're all in different economical places and and, 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 in different cities. It's not about that. It's the people that create the environment. Yeah, there's there's money involved. There's things that, that we need to do. But are we as leaders really looking at the experience somebody has? Because the truth is this. Man sees the outside. Man will judge us by how it smells, how it feels. What's going on? Only God sees the heart. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just read something that I'm going to put up on the screen. People are hugely influenced by their senses. What we see, hear, and smell. All those things produce emotions that tell us whether we like something or not. And that's just the way it is. How many people here... Well, I'm not going to ask that question because that might be a trick. Think of this. Think of this. A young man sees a young lady that he doesn't think is attractive. How many times do you think 
And how many young men do you think that are out there and says, well, it doesn't matter if she's not attractive. I want to get to know her because maybe she's a terrific person. <laughs> and all the men are laughing. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. But we think it's going to happen in our church. We think God is awesome. We can create an environment that's not attractive to anybody. It's only attractive to insiders. It's only attractive to people that go to our church, but not attractive. But people will come back because, because people will want to know God. That's not the generation we live in. It's not. And just like a young man is probably not going to see somebody that he's not attracted to, a young lady, and say, well, it doesn't matter. I just, I want to get to Norv because I'm sure she has a fantastic heart. It doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen in our churches either. If it's not comfortable, they're gone. And what I mean by that, if the experience isn't awesome, they're gone. I don't care how good you preach. I remember one time I was preaching in a place called La Piedad, which means the godliness. And this was the most ungodly place. And I don't mean by sin. I'll explain to you what that means. Dwayne, you'll know where that is. You remember La Piedad? I used to go through that from Guadalajara to, uh, to heading towards Caretaro, but it's about two hours out of Guadalajara. And it's in a farming uh, area, very agriculture, but La Piedad was known for the pig farms. So this whole area was known as pig, for, for pig farms. And um, so there was a young guy there. He was... He, he had started a church, and, and, and he was just buying some land, and he had bought the land, and now they had set up this, this kind of a tent thing, a big tent, probably bigger than this, this room. He, he had thousands of people come in this place, but um, so, so he asked me, he said, will you come out, will you preach at my church? This was years and years ago. I said, yep, I'll come. He said, okay, this is the deal. said, about 500 yards from the place that we bought, there are drainage ditches with I was negras. How would you? What would you call it? Kind of pig sewage. Yeah, that, that would be like pig sewage, and that's the and they would use that to irrigate the uh, the fields. He said so. At seven o'clock, he said church will start. Our service will start at 5:30. At seven o'clock, you must be done. I said, well, why? He said, because at 7 o'clock, he said, in those drainage ditches, the mosquitoes breed. And about 7 o'clock, black clouds of mosquitoes will rise out of the drainage ditches, and, 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 and they'll just, it, you have to be done. <laughs> so, so I said, well, all right. I was asking Carla, you said you were there with me before, and Carla was there with me. And uh, I, I said, all right, but I was, this is what I was thinking. I thought, that can't be true. <laughs> so they do worship, and of course the musicians went on longer than, than normal, and, and, uh, and somebody else got up and did a bunch of, a bunch of stuff, and so I started preaching. And, and, and I'll be real honest, I'm, I'm not always good, but it, it was good. <laughs> it, it was Awesome. So I'm preaching, and I was feeling, you know, so, you know, sometimes you just feel it. It's like the Holy Spirit is moving. Jesus might be here physically in this place. I was, I was feeling that. So I was just like, it doesn't matter. These people, it doesn't matter. God's going to move. And he had asked me to pray for, I think it was pray for the sick, but I know I had to pray for something. And, uh, and I thought, man, this is awesome. So I'm preaching along, preaching along, preaching along. And, uh, of course, I... You know, 7 o'clock came, and, and I didn't see black clouds coming out from the, you know, from the drainage ditches. But I'm preaching, and this is literally what happened. In the back row, people started, and they started, and you could see it. It was like a wave. They just went from the back row towards the front row, and everybody just got up and walked off. They left. I continued preaching. God was there. Holy Spirit was there. The anointing was there. I was awesome. And those people left me high and dry. They didn't care. 
It was the craziest thing. <laughs> and I would preach it. And I was like, okay, let's pray. We're going. And I, think, I think the pastor and his wife were there. It was, it was disaster. It was a disaster. I felt so bad afterwards. It was like that was total, that was chaos. And I was like, why didn't you tell me it was so bad? He was like, I told you at 7 o'clock you have to finish because mosquitoes come out. And they did. And the people, and it was, and I just, every time I think about that, that is. La piedad is my point of reference. Because I remember it was good. And they didn't, get, they didn't care. They were gone. They're like, Jack, you preach all you want. God, we're gone. And they left. Well, they didn't care. They just left. And, and the guy never did accomplish his, his goal there because they couldn't, they couldn't build anything that was comfortable. Now, you might not have drainage ditches and clouds of mosquitoes and, you know, at, at your church, but what is it that keeps people from coming back? What, what, what are those things? What, what is that excellence level, that wow factor, that, that deal of you've, you, you, you've, you've got a, a man, a 35-year-old man with a, a young family of three, and he's a, a, he's a business person, and somehow, some way, somebody in your church convinces him through a relationship for him to visit your church. How does he feel? Does he leave that place and think, I didn't understand what that guy was saying. I, I, I don't really understand what this all, is all about, but I like that. I think those are the type of environments that we need to create. And that's what God was, was saying to Samuel. Samuel, you look on the outside. I'm the only one that sees the heart. So as leaders and pastors, we have got to remember that just little teeny principle. When, when our Sunday experience, we have to think outside of the norm and think people are going to judge us by what they feel, what they see, what they smell, just, just the whole emotional experience. What does that lead them to feel? And if we can get that part right, the other part of it, we just add in there. You know, it's the same thing when you go to a restaurant. You go to a restaurant, you, 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 to, you critique the decor, the service. You know, was it prompt? Was it, did it take a long time? You know, the food, the prices. You're not, there, you're not sitting there thinking, well, the food's not very good, but I bet you that chef's got a cool heart. You know, I bet he's a good dude. So we're going to come back. People don't do that. You don't do that. People don't do that in your church. They're going to give you a shot. So what do they experience? That's what I want you to leave here thinking. What do they experience? If you're, I, I see a few people here that are church planners. You, you, uh, several people that have just started, weeks. Some that are, that, that are beginning to form a team to, to plan a church. There is just a basic roll up your sleeve, let's get this right part of ministry. You know, I understand the, the, the whole spiritual side of that. But there is just a let's get this right part of ministry that means is there a way I mean, in my world, this is what I do. I am not the lead pastor of, of any of my churches anymore. We've got a church in Southfield, a church in Monterey. We have campus, campus pastors, and we've got another church we're planting in Mexico City. And, and then I lead a church network in Latin America. And, and basically what I do is I preach. I carry a preaching load so that my pastors and my leaders can spend time creating environment. That doesn't mean that it's, that, that it's the most important thing, but it is an important thing. And you, your, in your context, that might not be possible. You think, I am the only communicator in my church. Well, okay, let's think about it. Let's figure this out. Let's figure out how can we build teams that, that are focused on what somebody is going to experience on a Sunday. Do we have a high level of excellence? Do you have a high level of excellence in your church? That's my question, because we make a huge mistake when, when, when we just think, and this is a truth, I'll throw it up there on the screen, I think that's where we're at next. Uh, the tangible has the potential to 
usurp the intangible. The tangible has the potential to usurp the, 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 the tangible. Or we, we, put that, we emphasize the intangible, sacrificing the tangible so many times. We think, well, it's, it's all about prayer. It's all about, yes, this is God's work and God, but God's, God selected you to create an environment. God selected you to make his church so irresistible that when somebody comes in, they may not believe the first time, they might not have a clue what you're talking about, them, but they want to come back. And I hope they understand it the first time, and I hope they, they receive Christ the first time. But if not, I'm going to create a church that is, that, that is so inviting, or my attempt is to create a church that's so inviting that they want to come back. I don't know what it was. It just, there was just something there. You and I know what that is, but they might not know what that is. So what are we doing? I'm going I'm to read what I, what I have here. You know, and, and I just want to say, somebody could think that, well, you know, um, you're only concerned about the, 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 the tangible things or, or the appearance. It just seems so frivolous what you're talking about. But I don't think so. I, I think Jesus deserves our best, and I think he deserves our best in everything. So I think, our, I think our churches just should be marvelous, spectacular, at whatever level that means. We may be a setup in a teardown uh, church. We might be a church start, whatever that means. We started our church in Monterey, set up and tear down, one full year. We created a volunteer team of 100 people every Sunday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, to come in to set up to have one service at 12 o'clock, and this baby was rocking. Excellent. That's why in three years the church is 800 going on 1,000. Because we created the environment, and then God did his thing. Isn't it cool when there's an environment, and then you can just, you know, the environment doesn't take away, and then it just enhances? I was sitting back there when, when, when the worship team was, was, was leading us, and that's the thought that came to mind. This is cool. We, we've been able to create an environment. And now, God, you just do your thing. You just do your thing. We're going to do the best we can to create the best environment we can so that any person that would walk in could just say, yeah, this feels good. Are we doing that with our churches? We make it easy for people to hear the message by creating high level of excellence and a great experience. And I'm just going to read off some things I've got on a list. From the moment they pull into the church and park their car. When they walk into the church building. When their children, from drop off until pick up and everything in between is laid out and planned out while using the restrooms. Did you know that uh, Barnum did a study and said the number one way people critique churches is by the women's bathroom? Number one. It's like, and us preachers think, nah, it's my message. No, they're checking out the toilet paper, whether it was smooth or not. You know, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what the critique in the woman's bathroom is. But, but you know, you, you go into a place and it's not to your, what you're used to. And, 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 you know, you walk out in the car, you think, dear, what'd you think? And, you know, she says, I, you know, it, it, seemed, it seemed all right, but I don't know. It just, I don't know, it just didn't feel right. And she doesn't even know that she picked up that feeling in the restroom. She doesn't even know. It was just like, it's like, this just didn't feel, you know, it, it wasn't to the level of clean, cleansly, cleanliness. Is that the way you say it in Spanish or in English? Um, number one way that churches are evaluated, the women's restroom. So what does that say to you and to me? That means what God told Samuel is true. 
people see the outside appearance. So here's my questions for you, and I'm done. First question, are the environments in your church attractive? Are they attractive? Do the people make them special? You know, think about Disney. Disney, Walt built an empire in a swamp. It was a swamp. I'm sure you've read the books. It was a swamp. And he built an empire in, in the magic kingdom in a swamp. So don't tell me you and I can't do it in a desert or in a, in, in, in a small city or in a town or, or, or wherever. He did it in a swamp. We can do it in our cities. So here's the question. Because it's the people that make a place so attractive. So, you know, I'm talking a little bit about, you know, about our local, we call it, our, our, our buildings and our stuff like that. A little bit. You know, excellence is, is what we should shoot for. But what about our people? Do our people make things just charming? Out of this world, incredible. That was my takeaway when Carla and I went to our own church a month ago. It was like, yeah, this is, it was good, but no, our, our, our people, we need to, I'm not doing a good enough job to teach our people how to make Jesus irresistible. Because my Jesus is irresistible, but the only way they're going to meet my Jesus is through me. So I want to be irresistible, and I want my people to create irresistible environments. So number one question, as you're saying, are your environment, the environments in, in, in your church, are they attractive, and, and are people making them special? Have you trained your people? Have you taken some time just to sit down and say, okay, let's look at the way this is. Are, are, is the environment visibly attractive? How do, they, how do things smell? Our church in, in Monterey, we're doing great, but the number one thing I tell Roberto, who is, who is our campus pastor, every time I walk in the door, we are on a major road in the city. And what that means in Mexico is that the major drains are underneath the, the, the road. So when you walk into our building or on the sidewalk, the first thing you get is this pungent smell. It's like we have got to do something about that smell. You know, do, do whatever we have to do. Dig up the whole road if you have to, but we have got to get that thing fixed. How does it smell? You know what, and how do, does it make people feel? Is it inviting when people talk? Are we talking a language that everybody understands, or are we just talking to insiders? Does somebody feel like an outsider when they, when, when they and, and that doesn't mean we change anything that we, that we do. That just means we explain what, we, what we're doing. I love for somebody to explain what we are doing. You know, if I leave this place and we leave this place tonight and you don't have a clue about what's going to happen tomorrow, you're like up in the air. It's like, okay, so what's going to happen tomorrow? I, do I get, okay, it's on the app, but somebody explain it to me. That's what we have to do. What does it sound like? So anyway, so those are the questions that you and I can just take away and, and I just wanted to do something really, really simple. But I'm going to do one more thing, and that's give you three pieces of advice of how to evaluate that. And this is something we did. First piece of advice of how to evaluate, number one, hire some Sunday inspectors. Hire some Sunday inspectors. About two years ago, I hired six people. Nobody knew that I hired them. I offered them, back then I think it was 500 pesos, which I think was 50 bucks. You'd be surprised how many people will go to your church for 50 bucks on a Sunday. <laughs> Two of them were saved, four of them were not. And I asked them, I said, I want to hire you. I'll give you $50 if you'll spend one hour in 10 minutes and come to my church. And, I, and I gave, we gave them a sheet, made out an evaluation sheet, and I said, I want you to evaluate us. And you evaluate us hard. Don't, don't this, just because this is a church, don't go easy on us. I want to know everything. Man, I'll tell you what, you'd be surprised what your church looks like through other people's eyes. Especially people that aren't Christians. 
They will tell you the craziest things. It's like, what? You looked at that? So first thing, number one, hire some inspectors. I hired six, cost me 300 bucks. It was worth 3 million bucks. So do something out of, oh, and by the way, three of the four that weren't saved, they're in our church now. Nini was one of them from the American school. And uh, she's active. I mean, they, they, they got saved. And it was like, it, that could be an evangelistic tool. I may have invented the new, latest, greatest evangelistic tool. 50 bucks. <laughs> With the excuse of evaluating the church. And you'll be surprised how unsaved people love the fact that they get to criticize you. It's kind of an outlet. It's, it's, it's pretty therapeutic. Anyways, um, look for non -pe non-church people and, and, and then give them an some, some way to evaluate your church. There's not just, I mean, we made something up. But, but that way, it, it helped them to go through and say, okay, I looked at this, looked at that, and then tell us what, what you think. It's, uh, it's cool. Number two is, is honest self-evaluation. Honest self-evaluation. No mercy allowed. No excuses allowed. True, raw honesty. What I mean by that is go to your church one Sunday when you attend. Just attend. When was the last time you attended your church? And people are freaked out from the, from the parking lot on. They're like, what are you doing here like that? I said, I'm not preaching. I know that I'm evaluating you. Just attend. Set it up. Somebody else is preaching. And you show up 10 minutes before service just like a normal attendee would. And then evaluate. And evaluate with no mercy. You'll be surprised what you learn. Third thing is develop a plan, you know, from that. Develop a plan. A plan. To create a system of consistently making things better in your physical environments and, and with the people that attend to those environments. So take those two ways of evaluating. Sit down. If you don't have a big staff, it might just be you and then you've got a group of, of core volunteer leaders. Sit down with them. Invite people to be part of that. You'll be surprised how people embrace excellence, embrace creating Awesome environments if you'll just invite them into that. So the Bible says, Matthew 5, 14 to 17, Jesus said this, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Think of that verse and think of your church in your community. Is your church, is my church like a, like a light that shines in my community? If I'm really, really honest, we haven't, we're not there yet. We have got to get better. That's my evaluation of, of our churches in our, in our different cities. Because Jesus deserves an awesome light. He deserves an awesome light. So he said, you know, instead, they put it on a stand. They, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your God in heaven. So we decide whether God's attractive to people or not. We do it through our preaching. We do it through our music. But friends, we do it through so many other things. And I think it's worthy just to think about that. It's really a simple truth that we talked about tonight. But it's, it's worth taking this home and getting with your staff later on and, and thinking about, okay, are we creating an environment that people love to be in? That even if they don't get the gospel the first time, are we creating an environment that they would love to be in. And if the answer is no, let's get to work and let's be that light that shines in our community. We can do it. And link anything we can do to help you. That's our goal. 
We're here to serve you. We're here to grow together. And we're here to do the work that God's given us. To share Jesus, and we do that through so many different things. And one of the things is to really look at are we creating environments that people love to be in, whether they understand our Jesus or not. Because if we'll do it, they'll come. They'll come, and we'll grow, and we will impact our communities. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you so much for these incredible leaders that I get to share with. Lord, I ask that you just help us to remember this real simple truth that you see the heart, but the people that we are so intent on winning for you really see everything through a filter that's, that's so earthly. And that we as leaders really need to take that into consideration. Lord, I ask that you would help each one of us to take and put this in our context, understand what you're saying to us and how we can grow and get better. And Lord, I thank you so much for it. Lord, I ask that you'd bless our time. I ask that you'd bless tomorrow in just a special way. Wednesday morning, as people go back, they'll be renewed, refreshed. Something new on the inside. I thank you for drawing our hearts together. And we honor and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Once again.